Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Brown, I work here at the Institute and I wanna welcome all of you as well as our C-SPAN viewers for our discussion this hour with Ambassador Nathan Sales, who is the State Department's coordinator for counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. There is, I think, a basic consensus that the struggle with violent extremism is at its core a political and an ideological one, and that we need robust and well-supported civilian agencies, strategies, and programs to compete in that space. Over the years, the concept and practice of countering violent extremism, or CVE, has come to mean many things to many different people. CVE has had some important successes and also some high-profile failures. It has thoughtful defenders as well as thoughtful critics. And there is a vigorous and healthy policy debate in and out of government over the nature of the threat we're contending with, what more needs to be done with our many allies and friends around the world, the effectiveness of our capabilities, and over what, in the end, realistic success in the political and ideological struggle looks like. Ambassador Sales is here to speak about the administration's policies on CVE and related matters. Ambassador Sales is a noted lawyer, scholar, and public servant. Before joining the State Department nine months ago, he was a professor at Syracuse University, where he taught administrative law, constitutional law, national security law, and counterterrorism law. Before Syracuse, he had extensive government experience as well, including his Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the Department of Homeland Security and in the Office of Legal Policy at the U.S. Department of Justice. Ambassador Sales is with us for just under an hour. After he speaks, we're going to have limited time for questions and discussions. If you have a question, uh, please jot down uh, on one of the index cards that's available in the back uh, your question. Uh, concision is key, please. Um, and my colleagues and I will be collecting the cards at the end of each of these rows, and we'll do our best to have your questions addressed in the time that we have remaining. With that, thank you, and please join me in welcoming Ambassador Sales. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Eric, for that kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be here with you at the Hudson Institute. As Eric mentioned, I'm a recovering academic, so it's a real pleasure for me to be here in the think tank world uh, to dip my toe back into these waters. Um, I'm, I'm here to speak about countering violent extremism, which is a critical counterterrorism tool. We're at a critical moment, a vital moment, a turning point in our fight against terrorism. We've made extraordinary progress against ISIS over the past year. Nearly all the territory ISIS once held in Syria and Iraq has been liberated. This fight wasn't easy. Our partners on the ground fought mile by mile, block by block, and sometimes house by house to free Raqqa and the surrounding countryside of this threat. The fight wasn't easy, but we have persisted. And while our victories on the battlefield are significant, they're not a permanent solution. At the State Department, we're focused on aligning our civilian responses to the terrorist threat with the military responses, because that is the only way to ensure an enduring defeat of our enemies. Our civilian efforts include law enforcement tools, things like prosecuting terrorists for the crimes they've committed, collecting battlefield evidence, and updating laws to more effectively target the threat. We'll need, we'll need tougher border screening and more robust information sharing both within governments and between them. We'll need to designate and sanction ISIS affiliates and financiers to cut off the flow of money. Another key civilian tool is countering violent extremism, or CVE. I think we actually need to be more ambitious than its name suggests, because in addition to countering the violence, we also have to counter the underlying ideas that animate it. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other terrorist organizations continue to radicalize and recruit. Their messages transcend borders. Over the last 20 years, this call to violence has resonated in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, and here in the United States. Despite our military successes, young men and women across the globe are still being convinced to join ISIS and Al-Qaeda or to commit acts of barbarism in their name. The United States and our partners must persuade them otherwise. We must engage 
in a contest of ideas. Today, I'd like to talk about American values and the threat posed to them by terrorist ideology. Then I'll discuss some of our natural allies in this contest and wrap up by describing what we in the Counterterrorism Bureau and the State Department more generally are doing to promote American values and American interests. The contest of ideas is not unique to our fight against terrorism. Throughout history, America's conflicts have often had ideological dimensions. During the Cold War, our objective was to contain and then roll back the Soviet empire. But we had to go beyond that. We needed to show that the ideology on which the Soviet system was based was false, that its teachings ran counter to the most basic human desires for freedom and dignity. And so we engaged in a vigorous debate through Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and other platforms to advance the values we share with our allies and partners. We were out to persuade the world that the Soviet worldview was wrong, both morally and as a system of governance. And we succeeded. Ideas matter. And where we find ideologies that espouse violence, deny freedom, and reject human dignity, we must stand with our partners against these threats to our fundamental values. Winston Churchill put it best. Arms are not sufficient by themselves. We must add to them the power of ideas. People say we ought not to allow ourselves to be drawn into a theoretical antagonism between Nazidom and democracy. But the antagonism is here now. It is this very conflict of spiritual and moral ideas which gives the free countries a great part of their strength. So what are the competing ideologies in today's contest of ideas? America is committed to individual rights, and we recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. We are all, in the words of the Declaration of Independence, endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. From this, we derive a number of specific values. We're committed to religious liberty, our first freedom. This is not just, as some would have it, a so-called freedom to worship. Our Constitution guarantees us the free exercise of religion, conduct in addition to belief and expression. We're also dedicated to the notion of equality before the law. We fought a civil war for this principle, and then we implanted it in our Constitution in the form of the 14th Amendment. We're committed to pluralism. We acknowledge that our fellow citizens will often disagree with us on the great questions of morality and religion and politics, and we're okay with that. We expect our government to be okay with it too. We deny officials any authority to mandate a uniformity of thought. Here's how the Supreme Court put it in a World War II era case. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. These rights and liberties are the entitlement of every American, no matter their background, no matter their creed. Let me tell you about Holt v. Hobbs, a Supreme Court case from 2015 that I think nicely captures the American commitment to liberty, equality, and pluralism. Gregory Holt was an inmate in Arkansas, and he wanted to grow a half-inch beard, which he believed he was required to do as an observant Muslim. Prison guards prohibited from doing so, citing the state's penal regulations. He filed a lawsuit, and the US Department of Justice took his side, defending his right to freely exercise his religion. The Supreme Court's decision in the case was unanimous. It held that Gregory Holt was entitled to an exemption from the ban on facial hair. Arkansas's interest in prison discipline had to yield to the inmates' right to religious liberty. Our adversaries reject all of this. ISIS and Al-Qaeda deny the worth and dignity of the individual. Here's how, Osa here's how Osama bin Laden once put it. We love death. The Americans love life. That is the big difference between us. Indeed it is. Today, we see the toll this bloody ideology is exacting on the world. It's responsible for the deaths of countless Iraqis and Syrians, approximately 100,000 Afghans, and on 9-11, close to 3,000 innocent people from 90 countries around the world. Its followers have enslaved women and girls from their families. They've beheaded sons on television. They've burned people alive thrown them from the tops of buildings, and drowned them. 
Our enemies are not shy about the ideas that inspire them to this brutality. Our enemies reject religious liberty, indeed all liberty, as they seek to rule by constant bloodshed. They reject equality and seek to empower themselves at the expense of those they regard as their inferiors. And they reject pluralism because they regard any other religion, indeed any other tradition within Islam itself, as a crime that carries a death sentence. And so as we confront terrorists on the battlefield, in courts of law and in other theaters, we also must confront the twisted ideas they use to justify their violence. We have allies in this effort, many allies, and we need to work with them as they share our values and they can credibly refute the violence, supremacism, and intolerance of our enemies. We also need to partner with government officials, but just as importantly, we need to work with community leaders, religious figures, and others who have the standing to credibly counter terrorist ideas. Luckily, it's easy to find partners like these. I've met with many of them since I took office just under a year ago. Let me give you a few examples, starting in Indonesia. Southeast Asia, sadly, is no stranger to terrorism. Last year, we saw ISIS seize a city in the Philippines, and earlier this month, ISIS-inspired terrorists carried out a series of attacks on churches and a police station in Surabaya, Indonesia. I recently met with Indonesians who are working hard to counter terrorist ideology in their country and throughout the entire region. Indonesia stands as a potent antidote to extremism. It's home to the world's largest Muslim population, and it boasts a long and proud history of religious tolerance and pluralism. Last year, a group of Indonesian students published an 8,000-word declaration on humanitarian Islam that reflects the best of their country's traditions. Their agenda focuses on three priority areas. They want to increase religious understanding and mutual respect, emphasizing what they term the humane and spiritual dimensions of their faith. They want to promote critical thinking skills to enable people to resist the siren song of radicalism. And they want to empower civil society to deter extremism. It's voices like these that must be amplified. They share the values that America holds dear and they're critical partners in our efforts to defeat terrorist ideology. Like Indonesia, Jordan is also a center of pluralism. Top Jordanian officials have supported interfaith dialogues that call for peace and tolerance, both within the Islamic community and with other religious groups. They're also tackling the inconsistencies between religious texts that have been hijacked by ISIS and the intellectual and philosophical legacies within Islam. They are scouring scripture to expose the illegitimacy of terrorist claims from within their own tradition. For example, one Jordanian scholar has said the following, a tiny minority of Muslims have fundamentally misunderstood Islam and are grossly misrepresenting it. True piety necessarily involves virtue and kindness toward others, all others, because kindness is the fruit and result of love. We were created to be kind to our neighbors, no matter who they are or what their faith. Morocco is a natural partner, another natural partner with a strong commitment to pluralism. To stem the growth of extremism, in 2015, the king established the Muhammad VI Institute for the Training of Imams. The institute also trains male and female religious guides, known respectively as Morshidin and Morshidat. Its mission is to promote religious scholarship and a message of tolerance, particularly in Africa. Today, this school attracts students from across the continent, and from Europe as well. A student body of over 12,000 people per year hails from places as far afield as Morocco, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Tunisia, Mali, Chad, Nigeria, Senegal, and France. Initiatives like these are growing a cadre of informed and authentic voices that will ultimately drown out the extremism preached by ISIS and Al Qaeda. So what's the US role in all of this? Candidly, I think we need to approach that question with a healthy dose of modesty. The federal government is not a religious authority. I certainly am not. And there are limits to what we can do to disprove our adversaries' theological claims. What we can do, however, is partner with leaders and authorities who share our values and who share our interests. So let me tell you a bit about what the Counterterrorism Bureau in particular, and the State Department in general, has been doing to support our friends in this contest of ideas. First, we're working to promote authentic voices that are committed to pluralism and human rights and that can speak credibly to those who are at risk of buying into terrorist ideology. 
One example is the Sawab Center, a partnership with the United Arab Emirates. Sawab is an Arabic word that means on the right path. The center develops and disseminates content that challenges ISIS narratives. Recently, it launched an internet campaign on the importance of giving to verified charities. It was viewed over a million times. We've also supported community leaders to develop tailored messages for local audiences. In Southeast Asia, we trained university and high school students to create and share videos on peace, tolerance, and alternatives to terrorism and the ideology behind it. Students learned how to operate video cameras, write a storyboard and a script, and edit their work. Even more importantly, they then held video screenings and discussions that reached thousands of other students with a positive message. In another initiative, we supported a documentary by mothers whose sons went to Syria to fight for ISIS. This widely viewed film showed the devastation that families experience when their sons and daughters abandoned them for a life of bloodshed. It forced would-be recruits to think twice about their support for terrorism and to confront the false ideas that encouraged them in the first place. The second thing we're doing at State is engaging with communities most affected by terrorist messaging. Civic leaders often are the first ones to spot the early signs of radicalization. They can function as an early warning system and an early intervention mechanism. When young people are on a path to terrorism, it's important to connect them and to connect their families to religious figures and mentors and other stakeholders in their communities. They need to hear strong, authentic voices whose messages of nonviolence and tolerance will resonate with them. That's why the CT Bureau supports the Strong Cities Network, which now includes more than 100 cities from every corner of the world. Under the City Pair Program, we've matched cities in the United States with counterparts abroad and encourage them to share information and good practices on how best to counter terrorism and its underlying ideology. These exchanges are producing real results. A few years ago, we paired Vilvorda, Belgium, with Columbus, Ohio. At the time, Vilvorda, which is a city just north of Brussels, had one of the highest per capita numbers of foreign terrorist fighters who were traveling on to Syria and Iraq to fight for ISIS. The Belgian delegation included Mayor Hans Bonti, as well as the chief of police and other community leaders. In Ohio, they met with a number of local figures, including officials from the Hilliard City School District. Hilliard has become one of the most diverse districts in the country, in large part because of an influx of Somali immigrants who've settled there. Columbus has worked hard to integrate these kids and build their resilience to harmful outside influences. When he, was, when he returned to Vilvorda, Mayor Bonte implemented new community engagement and resilience strategies. A few months later, Vilvorda had noticed a precipitous drop in foreign terrorist fighters leaving, down to zero. Vilvorda is now a member of the Strong Cities Network, and Mayor Bonte speaks regularly with mayors around the world about its efforts and its successes. Third and finally, we're working at the State Department to de-radicalize those who have proved susceptible to terrorist ideology. One of the groups we're focusing on is prisoners. We all know the story of Al-Qaeda's origins, with Amon al-Zawahiri and others who were further radicalized in Egyptian prisons. In the past several years, we've seen foreign former prisoners go on to commit attacks in Denmark and Belgium, among a number of other places. And as we prosecute foreign terrorist fighters who've been taken off the battlefield and sentenced them to jail for the crimes they've committed, we need to prevent them from radicalizing their fellow inmates. At the same time, Prisons can also present de-radicalization opportunities, as inmates can be cut off from their previous networks and contacts. In Kosovo, for example, we're launching programs to help prison officials manage and rehabilitate terrorist fighters who returned home, as well as other terrorist offenders. We're helping the Kosovars develop standard operating procedures for managing terrorist inmates and instructing their officers how to monitor communications and other activities. Of course, we can't just limit our efforts to prisoners. We also have to reach people before they commit the crimes that are going to land them in jail. And that's why the State Department helped create Hadaya, an international training center that's based in Abu Dhabi. One of Hadaya's most important projects is its counter-narrative library, which includes defector narratives from former terrorists. Many who left ISIS and other groups became disillusioned with them because of their brutality, particularly toward fellow Muslims and they have power story, powerful stories to tell that can serve as antidotes to others who might be seduced by the terrorist's siren song. Hedaya has used this library to create regional training guides 
on crafting messages to dissuade would-be terrorists. These narratives demonstrate that wherever terrorist ideology begins to take hold, it's also possible for us to free people from its clutches. In conclusion, ISIS is down, but it's not out. In Southeast Asia, in the Sahel, in East Africa, Europe, and South America, the threat of terrorism and the ideas that animate it are very real, and they're growing. Our military victories bias time to win a more fundamental contest, a contest between competing ideologies. This essential work will require determination and patience, but I'm confident that with the will and commitment of our partners, our ideas will prevail, just as they always have in the past. Eric and the Hudson Institute, again, thank you for hosting me. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Um, we have a bunch of questions from the audience, um, but I wanted to begin by asking something of you about the rule of law. You have a background as a scholar and as a lawyer. What role do you see the, the promotion of the rule of law playing in helping to build resilience in societies that are affected by violent extremism? Well, I think and how does the State Department coordinate with other government agencies to promote that? I, I think it's a great question, um, and it's an incredibly important part of the suite of tools we use to, to confront terrorists and the ideas that animate them. Um, rule of law instruments can have both tactical benefits and strategic ones. Let me, let me talk a bit about the tactical benefits first. Um, when you catch a terrorist who's committed a crime, a, a country needs to have the capability to investigate them, to prosecute them, for judges to adjudicate the charges against them, and then for these inmates upon conviction to be incarcerated properly. Um, so on a tactical level, building rule of law institutions that are capable of doing that um, is an incredibly important uh, priority. Those efforts also have broader strategic benefits as well, um, because we're not just talking about courts adjudicating cases, we're talking about a fundamental system of values, that this is the way you deal with disorder and, and, and violence and discord within society, not through arbitrary dictates uh, issued by authoritarian governments, um, but through the rule of law. Um, it's no coincidence that governments that are characterized by high degrees uh, of rule of law commitments um, display higher levels of resilience to terrorism and terrorist ideology that, than other forms of governments. And I think the reason is, is fairly intuitive. The reason why is fairly intuitive. Um, democratic systems based upon the rule of law give lie to the terrorist's false claim that a resort to violence is necessary to achieve your political objectives. It's never necessary, it's never appropriate to use violence, um, but in a system that gives citizens multiple outlets for the expression of their concerns and opportunities to seek change, it's even less appropriate. Right, right. I'm so glad that you mentioned G.P. Ansor's declaration on humanitarian Islam and a lot of the other projects. Uh, you had singled out some of the work being done in Morocco, both by the government as well as by religious leaders there, the work being done in Jordan and in the UAE. Uh, you mentioned that the US government has a role to play in amplifying some of those messages, perhaps providing resources and support. Could you elaborate a little on that? And I take your point about the humility and modesty that the US government needs to have in doing this work. This is not our necessarily our fight. But beyond the role of the US government, what can civil society, American civil society do? What would government ask American civil society to do? Well, I think the government would ask civil society to perform and behave as civil society does, which is to say, not at the direction of the government. Yeah. Um, that said, um, you know, private institutions, whether they are uh, academic um, or religious or otherwise, um, in the United States and elsewhere that share our national commitments to things like individual liberty, including religious liberty, equality, pluralism, tolerance, respect, um, organizations in the US and around the world that share those commitments um, don't keep your candle under a bushel. Um, 
it's, these are important voices uh, that, that can add to the conversation and, and that can demonstrate the value of our system of government and underlying that our set of social norms and values and the illegitimacy, falsity, and inferiority of a system of ideas based on compulsion, on violence, uh, on, on supremacism. We had a question opposite that from the audience about the Global Engagement Center. Um, specifically, is it still active? Is it growing under this administration? Uh, and how much of the Global Engagement Center's work focuses on terrorist recruitment via propaganda from countries like Russia and China? Right. Um, GEC, Global Engagement Center, is a very important partner of ours in the CT Bureau. Uh, it was originally conceived as a government body that could engage in the development of content and the propagation of content to address terrorist narratives um, and, and terrorist ideology. It has an even broader mandate now, um, as your questioner noted, focusing on other threats to the United States, state-based threats, um, disinformation campaigns launched by uh, peer powers or, or other state-affiliated uh, uh, entities. Um, so GEC is addressing the full range of national security and foreign policy challenges we face. At the top of the list, we find the, the CVE and counterterrorism issues that we're talking about today. And we also had another question about um, the fight in cyberspace and on social media. There's been a lot of criticism of um, some American companies, uh, social media companies, among other things, about uh, how they have served as a platform for spreading uh, radical ideas and for organization. And sometimes under criticism, they have been, some critics claim, have been slow to take down or to dismantle the networks that have been formed on their platforms. Can you give us a sense of, of how important you see um, the involvement and the responsible behavior of businesses in countering violent extremism? Certainly. Um, radicalism and the process of radicalizing take place through a number of different channels. Sometimes it's face-to-face. -face, um, sometimes it's online. And, and we have to be mindful of the various different vectors through which uh, radicalizing content is disseminated to vulnerable populations, to, to target audiences. Um, and the online space is obviously a, a huge part of that. I think Silicon Valley understands that the online space is a huge part of it. And um, I think they have an interest in their platforms not being seen as synonymous with Al Qaeda or ISIS. I mean, no, nobody wants to be the platform of choice uh, for Ayman al Zawahiri. Um, and so in, in recent years, we've seen them take a number of steps within the industry um, to sort of rally the industry behind uh, a shared sense of obligation to do more. Um, they, they founded uh, an organization called GIFCT. I'm going to forget the exact uh, name of it, but it's the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism. There, I did it. Um, the point of which is to enable incumbents in the market that have fairly well developed capabilities to share information and also share techniques with some of the new entrants about how to spot terrorist content, how to take it down, and so on. Um, so we're, we're encouraged by the steps that Silicon Valley is taking, um, but we're going to continue to encourage them to do more. We, we, we can't, we're trying to deny physical safe havens for Al Qaeda and ISIS in places like Afghanistan and Syria. We can't allow them to have virtual safe havens, too. We had another question from the audience about careers and what advice you would give to uh, uh, young people who are seeking a career in counterterrorism. Um, come work for me. Work for <laughs> Send an, ap an application. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I guess the best, that's, oh, yeah. there's, a, there's another dimension to that question. We're in a long struggle. That's become a mantra, but it's true. We're in a very long struggle. And when you think about how the US government operates and, and various non-governmental agencies operate, um, what new capabilities does our government need to compete in this long-term struggle? Mm -hmm. Where else do we need to make investments uh, in government and out of government to effectively work with our partners around the world? 
Well, so, so I'll answer that question, but let me actually answer the, the first question first, um, because it's the sort of thing that back when I was an academic, I used to get from, from my students all the time, and I, I quite enjoy answering it. There's no one path, I think, towards uh, a career working on these issues. And let me just say, you, you, you don't have to go work for the State Department, although we'd love to have you, or any other government agency. Um, there are plenty of opportunities to engage on these issues in the private sector, in academia, um, in think tanks, like the Hudson Institute. Um, so I think it's simply a matter of remaining current in the literature, um, coming to events like these, uh, and being mindful of unexpected opportunities that will present themselves. And you know, as an illustration of that, I can offer my own background as an example. Um, I started working on these issues by accident. I was a young lawyer, fresh off a clerkship here in Washington, D.C., uh, with a federal judge when I got hired to work on administrative law issues at the Justice Department. This was in August of 2001. And three weeks later, administrative law suddenly seemed a bit less important. Um, so we all had to get very smart on national security and counterterrorism issues pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and it was just that happenstance of being there at that moment in time um, that I began to develop a, a, an interest and focus on these issues. Um, now of course, we, we, we pray that there is never a, a comparably cataclysmic career shift for anyone in this room or watching on television. Um, but you know, mindful of those opportunities, um, to, to, or opportunities not like that, um, to, to sort of move into a space that you find interesting. Remind me of your second question. Yeah, the, the long-term capabilities that we need. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's been quite a bit of innovation uh, in our government. I think a lot of the innovation has been driven on the military side. We have an enormous amount of talent and expertise in our civilian agencies. I'm, I'm not always sure that they've been properly led um, with the right policies uh, with respect to this issue of CVE. Um, but beyond that, where will the innovation need to come from in the civilian agencies? Right. Okay. What new civilian capabilities do we need to more effectively counter violent extremism? So CVE is part of it, but I, I think we actually need to use a wider angle lens to answer that question. Um, one of the sets of tools we need is border security, um, particularly information about airline passengers who are, who are traveling to the United States or to and from allied nations. Um, you, you can't spot terrorists and interdict them at the border unless you know who's coming and going. Right. Um, so one of the things that's very important, I think, is uh, collecting information about inbound and outbound airline travel, and then using that data um, to match it against watch lists of known and suspected terrorists, which leads us to a second thing that, that uh, other countries uh, need to do uh, a better job of, develop those lists of, of known and suspected terrorists. In the US, we've been doing this since you know, the early post 9-11 era. Uh, a number of our partners around the world <laughs> are following our lead, um, but we think that it's such a useful instrument, useful tool to spot terrorist travel uh, that other countries need to uh, step up to the plate as well. Biometrics are a third issue. You know, terrorists will try to uh, masquerade, um, assume new identities. It's a lot harder to fake your fingerprints. Right. Um, so using biometric identifiers at ports of entry uh, it is a really valuable way to verify that the person who's presenting themselves as Joe Smith is actually Joe Smith and not, a, not an ISIS operative. So that's one suite of tools that I think the United States has been a real leader on um, and that we're going to be looking for other partners and other countries around the world um, to do more on. Designations and financial tools is another really critical set of, of capabilities. Um, you know, we don't just want to stop the bomber. We, we want to stop the guy, the money man who buys the bomb. So working with banks, working with uh, international institutions, working bilaterally with other countries, um, we need to be uh, imposing sanctions on those individuals and entities that are funneling money um, to Al Qaeda, to ISIS, to Hezbollah, um, and, and other entities like that that pose a threat to us and our friends. Excellent. We're skipping around here, but if I, if I might, back to the ideological dimensions of the struggle. We have a question about ISIL propaganda these days, uh, which uses a lot of justification, um, uh, attempts to justify its actions uh, based on uh, appeals to law, to legality, among other things. 
Do you think that leaders and members of the Islamic State genuinely believe in the principles of accountability and fairness? Or is this rhetoric simply designed to appeal to people for dignity and justice in war-torn societies? I, I think you can judge them by their deeds. Um, when you set a man on fire in a cage, yeah. you're not concerned about fundamental values like that. When you behead people um, and boast about it, your values are fundamentally inconsistent with those of the civilized world. So I, I would judge them by their deeds, not their words. We have another question. Um, how does CVE fit in with the State Department's broader diplomatic mission, uh, particularly in affected parts of the world like the Middle East, which I would argue is experiencing an unprecedented historical, uh, political, and ideological convulsion? Um, and we have the largest displacement of humanity since the end of World War II in West Asia. Um, uh, part of this is connected to the fact that there is a robust geopolitical and strategic competition in the region between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran in particular. Um, uh, but beyond that, the convulsion that we've seen have revealed that a lot of countries are very fragile and very weak. And the region has known that for some time, but in the tumult that we've seen since the 2011 Arab uprisings, uh, a lot of that fragility has, made, has become more and more clear. And it's being exploited by violent extremists. So I guess my question is, how does CVE and your efforts in the Counterterrorism Bureau work with other agencies in state and elsewhere to help build greater resilience in these societies? And where do you see in the Middle East situations of self-sustaining strength, if you will, that can become political models and models of good governance going forward that can help to show that there is a civilized way to construct a future for themselves? Well, I think you're exactly right that um, we're, we're living through a very interesting time in, in that part of the world. Um, the, the world is watching Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's uh, ambitious reform agenda. Uh, make no mistake, he has articulated and is pursuing uh, a quite ambitious agenda, not just to reform his country's economy and position it to compete on a global stage for decades to come, um, but more importantly for our purposes today, um, to also address the ideological uh, components um, um, that are important to a struggle against terrorism uh, and also for ensuring you know, the long-term viability of, uh, of, of, of uh, the, the Saudi system. We're encouraged by some of the steps that the Crown Prince has taken. As, as you know, um, he's announced that women will be allowed to drive for the first time uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, applauds these reforms, um, and we look forward to uh, continuing to see the progress that will be made in the region. That's good. Um, we have another question from the audience, which is uh, uh, dear to uh, a lot of us here at Hudson Institute. What does the USG do when non-democratic governments try to secure US help or approval for suppression of what they call terrorists or extremists, who are, in fact, nothing more than peaceful critics or religious or ethnic minorities, an example being the Uyghurs of Xinjiang in China. Well, when, when governments try to enlist us uh, to help them, they don't get it. Um, so let me take a step back um, and, and sort of lay out the big picture before answering the, the details of that question. Um, since 9-11, the United States has worked hard with other partners to establish uh, a rough geo, a, a rush, rough global consensus that terrorism is always and everywhere illegitimate. Now, the boundaries of, of that norm are a bit fuzzy, um, but I don't think there's any question that that norm exists. Now, that creates great opportunities for the United States and for like-minded countries that share our interests and share our values to cooperate together, to build alliances and coalitions around that principle uh, of, of countering terrorism. It also creates opportunities for our adversaries to use uh, pretextual justifications um, to say, well, this is really terrorism, when in fact it's simply a matter of uh, a domestic group seeking to exercise the sorts of rights and liberties that we in the United States experience every day and are grateful for. Um, so we're, we're always aware of the potential for 
um, counterterrorism as an important priority to be hijacked by other governments that have uh, ulterior motives, um, and, and we don't participate in that. Um, at, at a slightly more granular level, um, there, there are countries, um, th there are provisions in, in federal law that prohibit us from providing assistance to countries um, who have a poor track record when it comes to respecting human rights, uh, have a history of committing abuses, including against domestic, domestic dissidents. So the Leahy Law, for instance, requires us to very thoroughly vet the recipients of, of US federal assistance dollars to make sure that the American taxpayer is not subsidizing brutality. Right. Thank you. Um, we had a question as well about the role of CVE in war-torn places like Syria and Iraq, um, uh, particularly in the context of the counter-ISIS coalition. Uh, I mean, what role does CVE play in places where governance has failed, uh, war uh, and terrorism has, has um, uh, come to those areas? Um, what, what role is uh, your office playing in those areas? Well, it's, it's certainly, you know, it's certainly one of the important objectives. Um, the most immediate objective, the most tactical need, is to roll back the, the false caliphate, the, the, the physical uh, uh, occupation of cities, of countrysides, of oil fields, of um, um, entire swaths of land that, that ISIS once held and, and now uh, for which we are grateful has been largely liberated. Um, but after the military gains have been achieved, that doesn't mean the fight is over. It simply means that the fight is shifting into a, a new phase. Um, and in order to achieve an enduring defeat of ISIS, um, we need to use in addition to the military assets um, that have achieved so much, we also need to use civilian tools um, to make these military gains durable and sustainable. So things like, um, well, we talked about rule of law. So building the capacity of uh, governments, not just in the region, but countries that sent ISIS fighters into Syria and Iraq, right. enabling them, teaching them how to actually prosecute a terrorism-related case. And CVE is part of this as well. Um, when, when FTFs return home, we need to stop them from recruiting and radicalizing others in their community. If they go to jail for a crime they've committed, um, that's an opportunity to deprogram or de-radicalize them. There's also the first do no harm principle. Even if that's not feasible in a particular case to de-radicalize or a particular inmate, let's look at ways we can prevent them from uh, and their ideas from contaminating their fellow inmates. So I think um, CVE nests into a larger civilian counterterrorism architecture that becomes increasingly important um, now that the fight against ISIS is moving into this new phase. And what is that new phase? The, the new phase, I think, is um, an all-of-government approach um, in which we, we will continue to apply um, military pressure where needed to ensure the enduring defeat on the battlefield, um, but also uh, looking at ways to um, sustain those battlefield victories over the long haul um, through civilian tools like law enforcement, like financial designations, like CVE. Beyond the greater Levant, are there areas of the world where you're pursuing focused efforts at CVE as part of a preventative effort uh, to prevent the spread of ISIS? Well, essentially everywhere you see ISIS affiliates or ISIS-inspired violence, um, it's important for us to use the full suite of national tools there. Um, law enforcement will be appropriate in places like the Philippines, military, Tools will be important in places like the Philippines, as we saw with the liberation of, uh, of Mindanao um, in the past year. But CVE tools will be an important part of that conversation as well. Yeah, terrific. We have an interesting question about Iraq. Um, uh, the House NDAA passed last week sanction, sh sanctioning two Iraqi uh, militias. One militia, of course, was as Saib al, al Haq. Um, which won 14 seats in parliament earlier this month. Do you see this uh, hindering US-Iraqi CVE cooperation if it becomes law? Yeah, 
You know, that's such a fresh issue involving pending legislation on which the administration may or may not have taken a position that I'm going to punt on that one. Okay, fair enough. And um, we had another question about um, continuity and disagreement between the Obama administration's CVE policy and the Trump administration's CVE policy. How is what you're doing new and different, or how does it double down and deepen what had already begun under President Obama? I think you see a lot of continuity between not just the Trump administration and, and the Obama administration, but between the Trump administration and the Bush administration on um, certain hard power CT tools like military force, like drones. Um, I think it's a matter, when it comes to CVE in particular, um, it's, a, it's a matter of emphasis. Um, and at the risk of painting with, with too broad a brush here, I think one of the differences that, that we're seeing is um, prior CV efforts often emphasize the development aspects of CVE. Um, if you build a schoolhouse in a war-torn country, that creates educational opportunities, which creates more, better prospects for economic advancement, which means people will not be as easily seduced by radicalism, and so it's a counterterrorism program. Right. Um, chain of causation is rather elaborate. Um, under the Trump administration, I think the focus is more on the ideology, the ideas. Um, let's falsify, let's work with partners to disprove and falsify um, the, the, the ideology that terrorists use to radicalize and recruit. Um, it's more immediate, it's more direct, um, and I think that's one of the, the major differences that you're seeing now. There is an argument that some of our Western efforts to falsify um, claims made by various violent extremists rest on a rationalist fallacy and that the sort of context-free reasoning uh, that we use based upon empirical analysis and facts uh, doesn't work very well in some contexts, and certainly doesn't work very well in dissuading people who have already been radicalized from pursuing their agendas. Um, do you agree with that analysis? Uh, uh, what other ways might we go about neutralizing uh, problematic ideas which animate violent extremism? Well, I think human beings are, are rational creatures. They're, they're uh, capable of giving reasons for their behavior, and they're capable of listening to reasons uh, for why they shouldn't do what they're doing. Um, now, in order to fully develop that rational faculty such that people are um, receptive to arguments that would dissuade them from pursuing a path of violence, it's important that they cultivate the necessary critical thinking skills. So you know, one of the things we're doing, I mentioned a little bit in, in my remarks um, about our work with educational institutions right. um, and, and critical thinking skills in particular. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. Yes. Um, what we found is that uh, students in you know, middle school, high school equivalents around the world, um, it's, it's important for them to develop their ability to think critically through any sort of claim, um, but especially a, a claim made by a terrorist that you know you should leave your family, abandon your mother, go to Syria, um, strap on a vest, and end your life. Right. Um, doesn't sound like a particularly appealing course of action to me, to anybody in this room, to anybody watching on television. Um, one of the ways that you can develop people's, reinforce people's natural instinct um, is by equipping them with the critical thinking skills so that they can spot logical fallacies, so they can spot leaps in logic, so they can spot um, you know, other false flags. Um, and that's one of the important things that we're doing in the educational context. I agree with you. Education is the only long-term strategy. Well, it's the best long-term strategy and something that I think is woefully underinvested in right now. Um, uh, with that, uh, we're actually running out of time, and I know that you have to get to another appointment. Are there any final things that you'd like to say uh, while you're here? I'd just like to uh, thank you again, Eric, for, for inviting me to be here. I'd like to thank the audience um, here in the room and on television for spending an hour with us. Um, it's, a, it's a measure of how important these issues are, confronting our terrorist adversaries um, and the ideas that animate them. Um, and I'm grateful to everybody for their excellent questions. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Ambassador Sales. <laughs>